Transitivity. Transitivity. Oh, camel. Please, I'm not certain if I pronounced that right or not, but Tezos, a self-amending blockchain with inbuilt governance. At one stage, Tezos was worth over a billion dollars, so very well established here in the market. In this review, we're going to look at three factors that makes Tezos unique. And of course, we're going to look into some of the factors that have made it rise to fruition. Of course, there has been a lot of FUD around Tezos in the last year because of the litigation battles it has had. But if you're here to learn why Tezos is unique, then stick around. We're going to bring you the three factors shortly. I'm Maximilian. Welcome to BitAssist. If this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe to our channel right now. Cool. With that out of the way, I do like to start quickly with a quote coming from the team. So this is a quote from Kathleen, who is one of the co-founders with her husband. So the great irony of Bitcoin is that it's ultimately a tool for community consensus, but it's marred by a tremendous amount of animosity. I think what she means is the animosity between different people that want different things for Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin SV, etc, etc. So she says that Tezos allows for innovation to happen in a systemized way as opposed to one born out of politics. Take that what you must, um, but uh, I do agree with this slightly that uh, Tezos has been built uh, with inbuilt governance to allow us to all come to consensus. Okay, so we're going to start with an overview of what Tezos is, what it's done so far, and of course, um, where we see it going. So Tezos is a self-amending blockchain um, and a smart contract platform that works on a self-governance and self-evolution model. So much like most, they raised money via an ICO. They actually raised an enormous amount of money. They raised 66,000 Bitcoin, 361,000 ETH. Uh, this happened in July 2017. Um, and they also had quite a notable investor in Tim Draper. Um, that is actually what I think fueled a lot of this um, investment from the retailer is this investment by Tim Draper, who's a very well-known Bitcoin bull. Um, in uh, June of last year, uh, Tezos, a year after they made their ICO, they released their beta. Um, roughly a few months later, they went to release their mainnet in September of 2018. Um, they have been riddled with back-end battles um, and actually had four separate litigation um, filed against them, against the whole Tezos team. Um, so, but since then, Tezos has actually completed its first ever self-governing vote. Uh, this was in March, so not too long ago. They actually voted on to increase the block size. Now, this has been a very good example of why self-governance is important. Um, you'll see, you know, with Bitcoin Cash wanting to change the block size, they had to make a fork and it caused a whole lot of issues. Um, here at Tezos, they had their first vote and they voted on a on to increase the block size and um, everything went very smoothly. One notable factor is that since Tezos has started staking and gone to mainnet, Coinbase and Binance, who I'm sure of you all agree are the biggest in the industry in terms of names, have recently launched a staking service for Tezos. So that's very bullish for Tezos um, in its very early life cycle of being on the mainnet. So the three factors that uh, we think make Tezos unique. So it's on-chain governance and it's self-amending. It's got liquid proof of stake consensus mechanism. And of course, it's got smart contracts, but with a formal verification. So we're going to start with on-chain governance and self-amending and how Tezos does this. Okay, so on-chain governance and self-amending, what, what does this exactly mean? So the design of the system allows for a smooth evolution of the blockchain rather than having to do a hard fork. So in simple terms, it allows for everybody to come uh, to an agreement uh, instead of parties having to um, go in separate ways uh, evolving in a hard fork. So this is kind of how uh, the government's uh, system works. So developers would submit proposals. Uh, this would be for maybe an upgrade or for a change. 
Um, then they would request for compensation for their work. Of course, they would need compensation or they wouldn't be doing this work. Um, of course, a lot of us have a lot of affiliation to cryptos, but we're not going to do this for free forever. The compensation makes sure that the developers have a strong economic incentive to contribute to the ecosystem. Now, the proposal goes through a testing period wherein the community tests the protocol and that criticizes it for possible improvements. So like what's happened now, they've, they've, they've voted on the block size. Um, this would be sent to um, the community. The community would test this, run a few tests on it and see if there's any ways they or the community could suggest to change it, to better it. And then after that testing period would continue and potentially implement it. So it says after repeated testing, the Tezos token holders will then uh, have a vote on whether the proposal should be approved or not. Once a legitimate upgrade is decided on, a hot swap occurs on the protocol, which initiates the new version of the protocol. So once the, um, the majority vote has gone through, um, then there will be a swap to change it from one protocol or one um, part of the protocol to another or an upgrade. This leads to the protocol being amended or upgraded in a decentralized manner. So um, I would like to know from anybody watching this is that like, do you see the future of cryptocurrencies having to have inbuilt governance? So maybe Tezos is one of the first that is fairly well known with a large market cap that has inbuilt governance. Um, what other cryptos do you know of that have inbuilt governance that you think could be really great? And also, do you think that inbuilt governance is important for future cryptocurrencies? Let's move on now. So what the second factor that makes uh, Tezos unique, the liquid proof of stake consensus mechanism. A lot of us know what proof of stake is, a proof of work is, but what is liquid proof of stake? So Tezos is a liquid proof of stake system that requires one to stake, otherwise known in Tezos as bake, a certain number of Tezos tokens to participate in the consensus of the blockchain. So um, this is how it works. The process of staking Tezos tokens is called baking. You find and add blocks to the Tezos blockchain through a process called baking. Bakers get block publishing rights based on their stake. So more, the more uh, Tezos you have, the larger amount of stake you have, the large amount that you are baking, the more opportunity you have to be rewarded. Each block is baked by a random baker and then, a notar and then notarized by 32 other random bakers, which is um, much like, let's say, EOS. Actually, it's not like that at all, but EOS has uh, X amount of other um, delegated proof of stake. But with um, uh, in Tezos, it's completely random. The other 32 are random. Sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned that at all. But if the block is good to go, then the block gets added to the blockchain. The successful baker gets a block reward and can charge transaction fees for all the transactions inside the block. So once the successful person has uh, uh, baked a whole, a whole lot of Tezos, um, they will get randomized. One will be chosen. The other 32 need to notarize it. Once that has been uh, notarized and put onto the blockchain, that successful baker will be given a block reward. Um, and they'll be given the block reward from the fees that were inside the block. So that's kind of what um, the staking side of liquid proof of stake looks like on Tezos. So um, how does liquid democracy work? So it is a system that, fluid, that flu fluidly transitions between direct democracy and representative democracy. So in typical staking, you know, once you have your tokens, you stake them, you're in control of them, you're directly in control of your democracy, your vote. Um, with Tezos, it's slightly different. You can do it yourself or you can use a representative to vote on your behalf. So people can vote on their policies directly, as I've said. We can stake it ourselves or bake it ourselves and then go and vote on different proposals or uh, get block rewards. People can also delegate their voting responsibility to a delegate who can vote on, on the policies for them or on their behalf. The delegates themselves can delegate their voting responsibilities to another delegate who can vote on their behalf. This is called trans, 
transitivity. Transitivity. I was trying to say this earlier on. Can never get it right. But basically, in layman's terms, what it means is you're transferring your vote from yourself and putting someone else in charge. So this is quite cool because, um, you know, a lot of the typical people that use crypto have no idea how to bake or stake or vote on crypto. But maybe they have um, they know someone in the community that they really trust. They can put uh, give their tokens to someone else and they can vote on their behalf. So. Like I said in the overview that Binance and Coinbase have opened staking or baking um, requirements for um, Tezos, I think they will potentially be voting on the behalf of people that get their tokens staked with them. I don't know the answer to that. Okay, but um, it says here, if a person who has delegated their vote doesn't like the vote that their delegates have chosen, they can simply take their vote back. And vote on the policy themselves so there's a lot of flexibility here you're able to take back your vote if you lose confidence in let's say coinbase they're staking your tokens and maybe they're voting on your behalf and you don't like what they're voting on you can go unstake your tokens with them and of course vote yourself so again a question to whoever's watching this is that you know with uh, consensus how important to you is voting of course you want your voice heard right um, you if anything is going to change that might affect the value of your investment you may want to vote on it maybe like a shareholder give me a few examples of what you have voted on already if you're someone that's voted and if you think that voting is important um, so the third thing that makes um, Tezos so unique so it's the smart contracts and their formal verification so Tezos has been coded using a language called OCaml. Please, I'm not certain if I've pronounced that right or not, but um, OCaml, yeah. The smart contracts that will run on Tezos will be created using Mikkelsen. Okay, so these are two separate languages and they're known to be functional languages. So why do they use functional languages and why do they use these two in particular instead of like Solidity? So... These two languages, and because they're functional, they help with creating high assurance code because it's easier to prove how the code is going to behave mathematically. Any changes in the code are simpler to implement, and this makes reiterative re development easier. So as we know, Tezos is all about, um, you know, voting on things and changing things that they don't think that are correct or the community wants to change. So the code they're using, they need a code that's simple to change and, 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 and able to make different versions of it. So hence why they're using these functional languages. The individual functions can be easily isolated, which makes them easier to test out and debug. So um, that again is very important. So they're kind of modular. Um, this allows for it, a particular part of the code to be easily isolated to maybe run a test as it said or of course to um, potentially change any issues with the code um, in terms of like a bug or something like that um, these functional languages increases the readability and maintainability of the code um, because they are fairly simple to read uh, and fairly well known um, then you know a large majority of developers and people working on tezos are able to read this code and to maintain it. Um, Mickelson is strongly typed and is a stack based language. And of course, it can be easily read by humans, which is a big deal going into the future as more and more people use blockchain. We do think or I do think that people will learn more how to code. I myself don't know how to code and probably will never learn. But I do think going into the future, we need to make it as simple as possible for the layman to be able to understand um, uh, coding smart contracts and all the rest. Um, which, of course, will help in building the correctness uh, of the proofs and to help avoid any bugs. So those are the three ways that make Tezos unique. That's a quick overview. I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, so we've looked at the on-chain governance. We've looked at the liquid proof of stake. And we've looked at how their smart contract languages are different. Keep in mind, Tezos has had a great few weeks. So do go ahead and take a good look at Tezos if this is new to you. I've really enjoyed looking into Tezos. 
Do keep in mind, I'm still fairly new to Tezos. So if you have anything that I've got incorrect here, please do let me know so I can learn from that. And thank you to an article on Block Geeks that I've used to learn more about Tezos. If this is your first time here and you've enjoyed this, make sure to subscribe. And of course, if you think this was useful to you, give it a share to your friends or family. And of course, give it a good old like. Have a good weekend, everybody. I'll be with you again next week.